Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome here, distinguished guests. My name is Daniel Anish, and uh, I am a journalist with Czech daily paper Hospodárske noviny, which is, as I believe and hope, uh, still the best daily in Czech Republic. But this was the small promotion. And, <laughs> but this afternoon is I'm the least important person here today. I'm just to welcome you here on the Thomas Batya lecture series on responsible capitalism. This is the fourth installment of this lecture series, which is happening thanks to personal commitment and energy of Madame Sonia Batya, who is among us here, and thanks to the commitment and money as well of the Thomas Batya Show Foundation, and thanks of the organization skill of the Thomas Bata University in Zlin. And uh, not to waste much more time uh, on uh, uh, officialities, let me please invite Professor Peter Saha, the rector of Thomas Bata University, to give the opening remarks. Thank you. So soon, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, dear Sonia Batya, uh, respectable Petr Brabeck, uh, Excellencies, uh, dear guests, uh, students. So we are opening the first uh, event of the Thomas Batya lecture series on responsible capitalism. The series is uh, started in 2010. In all the previous season, we had excellent speakers highly respectable personalities. The fourth year took place in Toronto with Mr. Ratan Tata, head of India's largest business conglomerate, Tata Sons Limited. Second season here in Prague, uh, we introduced Professor Yunus, Nobel Prize winner and founder of Grimen Bank in Bangladesh. The third speaker, again in Toronto, was Paul Pullman, Chief Executive Officer of Unilever, one of the largest consumer products companies. Today we have the pleasure to have with us distinguished person, Dr. Petr Brabeck, Chairman of the Board of Directors. The lecture series is sponsored by Sonia, thank you very much, and Batya Shu Foundation, thank you to member who was agree. And uh, it's organized in Canada by the Schulich School of Business, which is part of York University in Toronto. And within the Czech Republic, it's organized by Thomas Bata University in Zlin. With, together with many others, like uh, Jakub Klepal Forum 2000. First, I would like to also remind you that this year is very specific. Thomas Bata would celebrate this 100 years birthday. So we are preparing many other activities, not in Prague, but in town called Zlin, especially in September. So I have limited time because the main speaker is here. I believe that you will have an unusual exhilarating experiences for only a select few. Thank you very much. And uh, let me please invite uh, Governor Singer, Singer <laughs> to deliver his invitation remarks. Thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you uh, to our panel discussion here at the Czech National Bank's Congress Center today. The topic of this discussion, I admit, is uh, pretty far away from the issues uh, we routinely discuss at the Central Bank. Issues that are mostly practical, often highly technical, generally unappealing or even boring, except some, for the public. However, there is one topic I can 
think of that might have a point of commonality between what we do at the central bank and what you are going to, uh, to discuss uh, here today. So let me, let me start by stressing that the topic of uh, the conference, responsible capitalism, certainly reflects uh, the receding deep crisis of, uh, of, the, uh, of some developed countries. However, let me also stress that there are many uh, developed countries that uh, the crisis has uh, not hit. Uh, by the way, one of notable ones is Canada. So in analyzing the crisis and current economic system, we should uh, focus more on differences among countries uh, and their systems rather than attempt to tackle the system from the most general standpoint. Still, there is an issue of general nature uh, requiring our attention. The fall of costs of communication and data processing, plus the same development in transportation, uh, led, uh, leads uh, to the deeper and uh, deeper interconnected world. This trend brings extensive amount of uh, clear benefits to all of us, but uh, has also some negative uh, consequences. One of those negative consequences uh, stems, uh, stems from the fact that denser and more pronounced networks of relationship of each of uh, all economic agents, being it firms or, or, or individual managers and others, uh, unavoidably blurs uh, accountabilities. As we are more interconnected with others, it's not only our decision, but always a decision of somebody else, the responsibility of somebody else, and, and those who witness the hyper-dimensional matrices of competencies among, uh, in, uh, in great international firms know what I'm talking about. And that leads to lower accountability. This issue also concerns central banks. As you all know, the independence of central bank in advanced countries has increased dramatically over the last two or three decades. This trend has sprung from the hard-won knowledge that an independent central bank offers a better guarantee of reasonably smooth economic development and price stability than do politicians, whose short-sighted interest extends often only as far as the next elections. Central bank accountability goes hand in the bank, hand with central bank independence. It is widely accepted that the more accountable, understandable central, bank, uh, central monetary authority is, the better able it is to influence the expectations of market participants, and so smaller are the changes it needs to make to its monetary policy instruments in order to achieve its targets. An accountable central bank, therefore, plays a vital role in market system. Currently, we witness a renewed discussion on what does this mean in the world, in which central banks play more and more significant role in many countries' economic uh, systems, more so because such, such role often brings more pronounced and more visible redistributive effects uh, that affect uh, the welfare of different economic agents in a different ways. In addition to this, it is widely accepted that central banks' responsibilities need to be widened and strengthened in the area of uh, financial stability, which is new area of uh, interference for central banks. So we are currently discussing uh, and developing the concept of responsibility highlighted by this uh, conference, also in sort of my area of interest. So let me, let me uh, wish you an interesting discussion and uh, a stimulating conference and uh, the event that, uh, that uh, brings enlightenment to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and let me not take, time, not take more time from, from our speakers and panelists. Thank you very much. I know it's not easy these days for you to speak about accountability of the Ch National Bank. And, uh, and um, so, but it's my pleasure that uh, I can invite uh, to the podium, uh, as I mentioned, uh, somebody uh, without whose uh, commitment it wouldn't be possible, uh, the, uh, Madame Sonia Batya, the chairman of the Bata Show Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is such a pleasure to be in Prague. Though my husband lived in Canada, part of his heart 
was always here in the Czech Republic. And I'm just delighted that this event is taking place here in this room. And Mr. Singer, I would like to express my thanks again to you for your generosity that we can use this wonderful venue. Now, the Parashu Foundation was, we established uh, this lecture series shortly after my husband died. His father had been a major influence on the life and he pursued his father's ideals. Both my husband and his father were talented businessmen and gifted entrepreneurs. Yet both had a vision of the role that business could play, not only in improving the lives of employees, but more importantly, in acting as an agent for social change. Both considered business to be a service to society. Through the business, they would put shoes on people's feet, create jobs, help employees with their careers, and thereby enable them to live a better life with their families. My husband promoted entrepreneurship by empowering employees in making decisions. He insisted that all employees continue their education, continually taking improvement courses on company time. And you also promoted healthy ways of living. It is therefore particularly appropriate that we are discussing the importance of people in today's panel discussion. The concept of the lecture series is to commemorate my husband's dedication to responsible entrepreneurship and service. I was married for 63 years, a long time, and my husband often stated that he didn't view the business as a vehicle for self-enrichment, but rather for improving the lives of company employees of customers, associates, of those who lived in the communities in which barter companies operated. The same philosophy motivates our whole family today, a conviction that business should be a public trust and should have values in which people believe in as part of a strong culture. Traditional assumptions about capitalism and its role in society are being questioned. In 2008, when we started the first lecture in Toronto, the concept that business should act in the interest of all stakeholders, not only shareholders, was rather new. There is now much more long-term thinking about the impact of business decisions beyond making profit for shareholders. Young people, in particular, demand more and more social responsibility from management in many areas, including integrity, transparency, sustainability, and equality. The number of non-governmental organizations calling for these changes has mushroomed everywhere in the world. Trust has become more important than ever before. Good leadership is assessed not only by profitability, but also by the long-term impact on society. These are the very important issues for a panel discussion, and I'm most grateful to our panelists for agreeing to participate and give us their views. I'm now very happy to turn it over to our moderator. Looking forward to your remarks. Thank you very much. I will now introduce all the, the speakers of our outstanding panel and uh, first I introduce them and then I will ask them to give the speeches. Uh, it's uh, for a, a journalist from a daily paper who just is trying to catch the latest news and to run uh, them into the paper for the deadline. It's uh, not uh, that common that uh, uh, 
we deal with such uh, big issues like uh, uh, corporate responsibility, because uh, this is something which uh, goes beyond the daily horizon. So uh, it's a great pleasure that uh, I, I, I can be here and uh, uh, I, I listen to uh, this uh, distinguished uh, speaker because they all have uh, experience in that field we uh, sometimes do, or we don't cover at, at all. Uh, our keynote speaker knows something about big corporations. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Preet, Peter Brabeck let Mate, uh, led the Nestle Group, which is the largest food company in the world. Uh, from two, uh, 1997 to 2008, first uh, only as CEO and then as uh, chairman and CEO, and he has been with uh, Nestle Group as uh, chairman of the board uh, till now. At the same time, he is uh, vice chairman of both of L'Oreal and uh, uh, Swiss Group, uh, which uh, credits Swiss Group, which uh, it's quite a portfolio and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I believe that uh, we will hear here today from as well other side of his experience, which is, for example, his chairmanship of uh, 2030, 2030 Water Resources Group, which is public-private partnership, which connects private money with public interest, with public money, with expertise uh, from uh, academia and with NGOs in the field of water management. Because uh, as I read, you are uh, much uh, mainly interested in developed world, but I found that in Czech Republic, you, for example, work with Nadace Partnerstvi. So if there was Anybody interested in water management, looking for money, you can go to part Natasha Partners' website and maybe you will work sooner or later with Mr. Babek Letmate. Uh, I believe that Pavlina Kalusova is on the panel not to represent the better half of mankind, but because she really, in her daily job, deals with is the very topic of uh, this event, and this is corporate social responsibility. Pavlina Kalusova is chairperson and founder of Business for Society, which is leading association in the field of corporate social responsibility in Czech Republic. She worked for uh, 60 uh, corporations and advisor or in different, posi in different positions. And uh, it's great that uh, she brings this experience from private sector to the public sector and uh, to the level of uh, Czech government, because she is as well the deputy chair of governmental council for civil society and uh, vice chair of the committee for legal and fiscal affairs at the governmental NGO council, Rada Vlády pro so, uh, and uh, as I read, you were always involved in one of the interesting projects, which is the DMS. This is Donors SM MS, SMS, which uh, in fact for ordinary people like me, a gouge potato sitting in front of TV is a chance to be charity giver. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jan Bubenik, uh, we have some young audience here, so you maybe don't remember that, that he was one of us, or one of you, a young <laughs> student leader during the Velvet Revolution 1989. I am not sure whether he is still glad that it's mentioned all the time around, but I think uh, you should be proud of it, because we will have 25 years this year from 1989, and uh, we can all see that uh, the struggle is not over. But uh, then you uh, switch uh, <laughs> to your career. You became a successful businessman. You are founder and uh, partner of your company, Bubeni Partners, which is an advising company. And I would say that uh, uh, I will not reveal any secret that you are so-called headhunter, which doesn't sound nice to me, headhunter, but you have to take it to the, to the other 
end of the chain. Once you are headhunted, then you are probably hired. If you are lucky, then you can make a good living or, and help others and uh, fulfill your dreams. So it, maybe it shouldn't be called headhunting, but full dream fulfilling. <laughs> and uh, I guess that uh, Mr. Bubenik will speak here as well about his other experience, which is that he is the head of Corporate Council of Forum 2000 Foundation, which uh, you may know that uh, this foundation connected with our former president Václav Havel, and they are doing a great job in promoting human rights and as well as something what we could call corporate responsibility. So this is uh, all from me, and uh, please welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Peter Brabeck. Let's matter. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Anis, for your kind introduction. Governor Singer, thank you for having us in this wonderful room. Mrs. Uh, Sonia Pata for accepting me to be a speaker at this important lecture. My fellow panel members to accept me on the panel and all of you, ladies and gentlemen, here in the room for taking your time to listen to a subject which is very close to my heart. I was asked to talk about people as a key to a successful business. So I have a very precise subject for today. Uh, in the afternoon, I'm going, later on, I'm going to talk about perhaps more corporate social responsibility. But this question about people is a topic that is fundamental to the company I'm chairing, Nestle. It has been a long-held view in our company that people make the difference, and the people are at the core of our organization. All our business drivers are people inspired, and we put people at the center of everything we do. And I contend that in the future, investing into people will be even more critical to our success than perhaps never before. From the very beginning, people have made the difference, starting with our founder, Henri Nestlé, without whom I would not be standing before you today. Henri Nestlé was a political refugee from Germany. Yes, even they had political refugees in the middle of the 19th century. And he was received open-armed by Switzerland like so many political refugees have been received open arms by Switzerland. And he was a chemist and he saw a big societal problem. That was infant mortality. 147 babies out of 1,000 died because they could not be fed. And out of this societal challenge, he developed this new technology and based on scientific research, his first product which was an infant formula. And that's how our, uh, how our company has been founded. And since our founding in 1866, Nestle has grown into the leading fast-moving consumer good company of the world, but more importantly, into the leading nutrition health and wellness company. Global headquarters still in Switzerland, still in Bebe, still in the same small place where we have been created and today more than 340,000 employees, direct employees all over the world, and about 1.2 million people who are working indirectly for us. Our employees now work in factories and offices in more than 150 countries, and we are selling over 2,000 brands, and we'd have to sell in order to get our turnover more than 1.2 billion products every day. Every single day, 1.2 billion products have to be sold in order to get to our turnover. And for almost 150 years, Nestle employees have been motivated to work together toward one single purpose, and this is to enhance the quality of life with good food and beverages everywhere for all consumers of this world at all stages of their life. That's what inspires them. That's why they come to work. It's not because of the salary. It's because they know that's what we want to achieve. We want to work together to enhance the quality of life of the consumers all over the world. 
And our strategic performance framework clearly outlines the factors which are critical for our success. And it starts as it has to start in an environment that we are, in a capitalistic environment. It has to start also with the financial performance. And for the financial performance, we have what we are calling the Nestle model. Very simple, very simple. We want to achieve every single year organic growth, which is internally created growth by our own people of five to six percent, but together with every year an improvement of the profit margins. There is no either or. There is no either we are growing or we are improving the profit margin. There is an end. We want to do both of it, and that's a challenge. But it's a very inspiring challenge from a financial point of view. However, inherent in this framework is our long-term approach to our employees, our consumers, and the communities in which we operate. We view our people, our culture, and our values as an important competitive advantage to be nurtured and managed with the same long-term view as we do financial performance. So how specifically has our commitment and approach to people driven our success over those many, many, almost 150 years? But first of all, very importantly, we respect and we are open to diverse, to diverse cultures and traditions. We do not try to make out of a Chinese a Swiss or out of a Chilean a Spaniard, not even out of an Austrian a Swiss. <laughs> we try to integrate all of those cultures and rather than impose ourselves on them. But we're also staying true to the fundamental values and principles that we have laid out, which we call the Nestle Management and Leadership Principles. And we believe that diversity and the cross-pollination of ideas and experience drive competitive advantage. And this is why expatriation has been a critical part of our talent management practices for decades. We have many examples within the group of business results being driven by culturally diverse groups who have been able to bring about better, bigger, and faster innovation. And secondly, we are committed to develop local talent. We are a global company, but with a strong local footprint everywhere we operate. As a food company, we know that we must be close to the consumers to achieve growth, as food, by definition, is local. There is no global consumer in the food and beverage business. And taste is influenced by history and tradition. Our, therefore, very decentralized approach has allowed us to support independent, strong local businesses with greater consumer insight and accelerated execution at the local level, and therefore better business results. We believe that the key to our success and competitive advantage is our local approach to people and the value we place on local cultures and local decision making. It is our view, however, that no company, including our own, can afford to rest on its laurels no matter how successful its track record to date. Companies that fail to value human capital will be outstripped by those companies who do. Investment in human capital development will be the sine qua non for success in the future. So why do, I do, why do I say this? Well, many are predicting that talent shortages will be a reality in the not too distant future. And that's not only Switzerland, not only in Europe, it's also, I think, here in Czechia. Already in 2011, the World Economic Forum was predicting an area of unparalleled talent scarcity, which if it is dismissed now, would slow economic growth worldwide. In their report at the time, it was suggested that, quote, 
the human capital would replace financial capital as the engine of economic prosperity. Additionally, in a recent conference board study of over 1,000 CEOs from all over the world, there is a clear recognition that human capital is the engine of the enterprise, and human capital as an enterprise-wide driver is a top-ranked challenge for a modern CEO. And the causes are varied. In the Northern Hemisphere, aging populations and the retirement of baby boomers will result in talent challenges. In the Southern Hemisphere countries, and perhaps with the exception of Australia, the talent gap will be, will be due to lower skill levels caused by lack of educational infrastructure. Looking forward, less than a decade ahead, there will be an alarming gap in occupational clusters for high skills profiles, such as managers, professionals, engineers, and technicians. So the question is obvious. What is and should Nestle do to reverse this trend and to fuel our own competitive advantage, and by that also the competitive advantage of a Europe? Allow me to spend perhaps the next few minutes discussing three areas where we are investing in people for the future. The first is building a strong leadership pipeline. And this has been a priority for the Nestle Group for many years. We have made explicit our leadership framework, have put our senior leaders through focused training, through a long-standing relationship for example, with the London Business School, the Cambridge Programme for Sustainability uh, and Leadership, and the Institute of Management Development in Lausanne. And we have put a premium on international career development, as I mentioned it before. In 2012, we strengthened our leadership framework to highlight the importance of leadership at every level, not only on the top level. In the beginning, we had only the leadership programmes for the top 2,400 people. Now we are talking every level, from individual and teams to executive manager. And we have put a strong focus on mentoring and coaching as a means to accelerate professional development. As a result, more than 95% of our top 1,300 positions at Nestle are filled through internal promotion, more than 95%. And we have a strong internal pipeline of successors for senior roles and therefore primarily focus our external recruitment on the entry level and on the young professional levels. For my second example, I turn now to the role of women in society, which has been a strategic focus for Nestle for some time now. According to the World Bank, and I quote, Women perform 66% of the world's work, produce 50% of the food, but only manage 10% of the income and own 1% of the property of the world. And for its part, the International Monetary Fund states that, quote, despite some improvements, progress towards leveling the playing field for women has stalled over the last couple of years. Ladies and gentlemen, this is bad news for everyone because it translates into lower economic growth amounting to as much as 27% of per capita GDP in some countries. At Nestle, we recognize that gender equality and women's empowerment are critical to creating shared value for our business and for the society we are living in. And we believe very strongly that we have a role to play to improve gender balance within our own company and have taken steps to create the conditions for this to happen. The founding, for example, by Nestle of the International Dual Careers Network in 2011 in the Lake of Geneva and now in nine locations around the world is just a case in point. And this was in response to changing demographics within our own internationally mobile talent pool. With an increasing number of dual career families, 
There was a real need to help facilitate job searches for the partners of our employees, both men and women, as they move into international assignments. We believe we can also play an important part in providing opportunities for women connected to our business. And to this end, we are strengthening our business-related activities and programs to promote gender equality, capacity building, and education for women and girls. Last year, as a, as a testament to our commitment, Nestle became a signatory of the Women's Empowerment Principles. And since action speaks always louder than words, I am pleased to say that in more than 20 Nestle markets around the world, we are just now empowering more than 700,000 women who either sell our products in the local marketplace or whom we are supporting in their community through the establishment of educational programs and development infrastructure specifically for them. I know our gender balance journey is vital if we are to be successful in the future. Women as employees, as primary consumers, and as our partners are key to our success today and tomorrow. And finally and thirdly, I will touch on the important topic of youth unemployment. Here in Europe, the financial crisis has resulted in economic, social, and in some cases, political crisis. And as a result, unemployment has increased, particularly youth unemployment, which is still growing in some countries, impacting one in four young Europeans, which means about 5.6 million young Europeans are now unemployed at that moment. In December 2013, the EU youth unemployment rate was 23.2% with countries such as Greece and Spain recently experiencing unprecedented highs. 59.2% for Greece, 54.3% for Spain. This is a full generation that is being lost to the workplace. Despite programs put in place by the European Union and national governments, growth is still lagging and the European economy is not able to create much needed jobs. At Nestle, we fundamentally believe that the private sector has a role to play as a public sector and governments will not be able to solve those issues alone. Nestle, for its part, has had a long tradition of recruiting and developing young people. We also believe sustainable and so socially responsible growth is achievable here in Europe. We are optimistic. We believe growth can be created in Europe, and we know we cannot do so without young people being at work. We are investing and growing in Europe, and we need to attract and retain the best talent if we are to gain competitive advantage in a slowly recovering economy. It is with these objectives and principles in mind that we launched just recently Nestle Needs Youth, an initiative that was launched in November with the support of the European Union and Member States. As part of a three-year Europe-wide youth employment initiative, we have committed to offer 20,000 new job opportunities for young people below 30 years old at Nestle in Europe. And through the program, we will offer 10,000 jobs to people under the age of 30 by 2016, we will create a further 10,000 apprenticeships and traineeships in Europe, and will conduct a readiness for work activities, such as CV clinics, job fairs, and information sessions for young people all over the place. The roles we are making available within the company will be across the business and at all levels from operators on the factory floor to sales assistants and business management. We are looking for talented young people with vocational skills and training, as well as graduates seeking the first position after university. 
In addition, by working collaboratively with business partners, we know that we can have a much larger impact. So therefore, we are also encouraging our 63,000 suppliers, European suppliers, to do the same thing, to join us and to offer jobs, apprenticeships, and trainingship to young people. And we plan to launch this new alliance for youth in the coming months with the objective to get as many companies as possible to join what we call the Alliance for Apprenticeship. While I have focused my remarks on the youth initiative here in Europe, suffice it to say that we have been developing local market talent around the world for decades through graduate recruitment and development programs. Many of our senior executives started their careers at Nestle in this way. We know through experience that the commitment to young people pays always dividends in the long run. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to close the way I started with a simple, very simple message. People make the difference. We believe that we cannot and we should not rest on our laurels when it comes to people. Rather, we should continue to take a long-term approach to creating shared value. Companies that are destined to win in the future must have a very strong sense of purpose. They have to be performance and people-oriented and strongly rooted in values and in principles. We must have talent management strategies that are not only aligned to the business direction, but also meaningfully connect at the local market level. Tomorrow's success requires an unwavering commitment to people, employees, consumers, partners, and society at large. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We will leave the Q&A section after all the speeches. So I ask, please, uh, Pavlina Kalusova, the floor, microphone, and audience is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, maybe three thanks you. Three thanks at the very beginning. One, the Bata for uh, Bata Foundation for the invitation. From, I, I have been active in the CSR uh, field for the last 15, 16 years, and BATA was only, always a symbol of uh, corporate social responsibility in the Czech Republic. And I think uh, that um, uh, there is a reason why we have this lecture on responsible capitalism on the name of uh, Mr. BATA today. Uh, the second thank you is to all of you for coming today because um, for me, as a person who uh, stands behind responsibility, to see uh, you know a full house uh, of people interested in this issue, um, it's a celebration actually. And the third thank you is to Peter uh, for his remarks at the very beginning, but especially for one, he mentioned the women equality, and I'm very happy that uh, nowadays uh, men are pushing the agenda uh, for women, and I'm very happy, happy for this. Um, I'm a sustainability professional. I believe that um, you know, we have one, there is only one journey to ultimate success. This is a system that is based, that is wise, that is sensitive, and is based on future thinking. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aware that businesses play a crucial role in, um, in sustainability. Um, over 70% of the global CEOs believe that embedding sustainability into their core strategy brings them success. It brings them growth uh, uh, in revenues. But they also accept that just few companies are able to integrate values into everyday business uh, uh, and across uh, organizations. Sustainability is among uh, all other things, uh, is about ability to innovate and ability to adapt to changing world. And we can't do this without people and talent. 
I was asked to have a very brief remark and I decided sort of to bring three rather challenging questions and notes. The first one is, um, you know, businesses are looking for talents and the natural pool question would be where they would like to find the talent. And I'm pretty aware that the natural answer would be among young people. But is it real so? As, you, as we heard, there is a challenging situation in Europe. And I you know, just mentioned two aspects. 50% of the graduates in Europe are not able to find jobs. Whereas 27% of employers had to leave job vacancies open because they were not able to find uh, young people equipped with the right skills. Unfortunately, the situation in the Czech Republic is no different. Um, when you ask the employers about the current situation, over 60% of them say that they are not able to find young uh, uh, people that they would like to hire, that they would really fit in skills that companies uh, need. The second uh, sort of challenging question is that are we, our businesses, employers, are we all able uh, to identify where the quality and talent comes from? Is it, is it coming from universities? I'm not pretty sure. The, the link between the good diploma from a university and a you know, set of skills that you would need for your future life, I think this line has been broken. And at the same time, the diploma from a good university does not lead to a good job uh, uh, naturally. People who stand behind the most successful businesses today have no academic education. One of the most desired employers around the globe, Google, is hiring not based on diplomas, not based on your grades from universities. They are based on your skills, ability to innovate and solve issues you know, in an innovative way. That more and more people, for example, in companies like Google that are working there have no academic background at all. The other issue is that a lot of the talent is somehow uh, um, outside the system that we know, schools and the business. Last week, uh, the Czech court made Adol the free first teenage entrepreneur, a 16-year-old owner of a company. You know, you see the raising culture of startups, social innovation projects, but you see them outside the traditional systems. And the last challenging question I have is that um, we see this, the situation is like this. We see the system needs to change, but where does the change come from? The schools? You know, we see the educational system, uh, you know, suffering from uh, internal issues. They suffering in the Czech Republic, especially from several political experience, ex experiments. And um, um, they are more involved in the quality of internal education than, a, than about uh, thinking about what's outside <laughs> their organizations. At the same time, companies and businesses you know, they are pushed to think in a short-term run because they are being evaluated on a short-term uh, result. So we see, you know, when we look at the Czech situation, for example, we see uh, top 100 companies. We see that a majority of them invest into education. Actually, education is the most financially supported area in the Czech Republic. But does it lead to the sol solution of a, of a problem? I don't think so. We have companies that are overtaking the responsibility on behalf of the public, uh, uh, public arena. We see companies like Chess, Microsoft, Škoda Car, um, uh, IBM uh, and others that are uh, very actively trying to change the educational system. Some of them even uh, founded their, or the, their own secondary schools and uh, universities. But what we are lacking is the long-term vision. One side on the educational systems, uh, per, from the educational system perspective, from the business perspective, we, we lack a long-term vision about being able to define the skills that the business will need in five or 10 years. So 
I think that these questions we really need to discuss, and even though um, in the, from the perspective of sustainability, because sustainability is not about the success of individual organization, it's about the success of a system. And we only can achieve the success of a system if we understand each other and we know the journey where we are going. Thank you. Thank you. I can, I can see that you still have some work to do. You mentioned 70% of CEO agree that sustainability should be the goal, so you have still 30 of them to pursue. Where so, are they? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, and please, Hansa, take the floor. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Batya, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, hello, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here uh, today uh, with you here. Uh, I guess I never had such a uh, privilege to speak after such eloquent speakers who would be beating my own drum. You know, uh, and being a drummer man, Bubenik, uh, it helps you. Uh, and also, uh, thank you, Danielle. Uh, nobody as yet called me such a nice name. In Czech translation, they call it skull hunter. I said, no, it's not the skull. It's not the bone I'm interested in. It's the soft tissue beneath. You know, it's the brain. And uh, uh, so, dream fulfiller. Uh, I wear that with pride. Uh, it is about people, uh, as we heard, and. Uh, most people tasked running organizations uh, understand uh, today that it is true that IT systems, strategy, even capital is basically a commodity. You can buy it, but uh, I consider it uh, these elements as a very important uh, organs in our body. But what keeps it running and what makes it an uh, alive is the blood, and that's, for me, uh, the human capital, uh, the every individual which contributes to common goal. Uh, it is my everyday work, job, and passion to identify, to assess, and attract talented people and help them to maybe fulfill not, on, uh, not only their personal dream, but the dreams of the founders, of the stakeholders of companies. Uh, yes, we do evaluate uh, their experience, we evaluate their skills, but at, uh, as Peter said, this is a uh, necessity, uh, but not sufficient condition to actually fulfill their roles. Uh, there was a study done just after the crisis which evaluated why CEOs have been fired. They have been hired mainly for their uh, IQ, for their formal knowledge and experience. But guess what? I mean, they've been fired for not being able to connect, uh, connect on a social level with the stakeholders. That's what we call emotional intelligence or social intelligence or contextual intelligence to actually understand how your knowledge is being used when and how in interaction with human beings. What we evaluate and truly look for is the evidence of being able uh, to demonstrate a leadership, uh, to demonstrate ability to connect people for social and contextual intelligence applied in real life, and that's what I call leadership. True leaders are able to create an environment where every individual is capable of contributing to, to the common goal to the best of their abilities. True leaders can create an environment where it is very clear who and why is successful and who and why is also at the same time happy, satisfied, and sometimes uh, we call it engaged. It is necessary 
prerequisite for the personal values of each employee, uh, employee to hugely overlap with the values of the corporation to have a sustainable relationship like you have with your wife or other partner. Uh, for that, uh, and have an engaged uh, people, uh, not to avoid the divorce of that relationship. Uh, there are a few very simple uh, things to be done. They are simple when we talk about it. It's much more difficult to be consequential uh, and actually have them done in real life every day. Uh, first of all, every person needs to understand how their small contribution uh, makes a difference, how that small wheel makes it uh, unique for the whole machine to turn. There's an old anecdote which illustrates that. Uh, a group of Japanese visitors came to NASA, uh, and uh, they went to the bathroom, and there was an old janitor sweeping the floor. And they asked him, what do you do, what do, you do here? He said, I helped to get the man on the moon, of course. You know, if each company would be able to have such an identification, uh, the understanding of how my uh, everyday work contributes to the whole uh, common goal, we would not be talking about it, about the <coughs> importance of uh, human capital. Uh, the other thing is that each of us uh, actually needs to be treated as a human being. Somebody at a workplace, whether it's our boss, ideally, or somebody else, have to express an interest in us as a human being uh, rather than uh, capacity or a machine. Uh, give you an example, in my previous work, I had a boss who said, hey, Jimmy, uh, great, I mean, you have a newborn. Uh, congratulations, I still need your report at one o'clock. You know, uh, I had a, another boss who, uh, at the same occasion, uh, told my friend, he said, Go home, this is a special occasion. I know you were trying for a long time. Have fun with your, uh, with your wife and, and newborn, and we'll all pick up the slack. I, mean, I, I guess you, you feel the difference in the approach. Uh, the other thing is that we all strive for, uh, uh, you know, being, feeling successful, and that comes from being competent. But uh, because we are curious human beings, uh, being competent for a while, it's not enough for us. In order to be engaged, we, we would love to explore and discover. And for that matter, we need to have an opportunity to learn and grow. And with that, uh, this is important uh, to be able to make mistakes because that's how we human beings learn. And good organization allow uh, people to make mistakes in a uh, decently controlled environment so it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't go bankrupt after we make such a mistake. But uh, that's another way how to, uh, uh, how to keep people engaged. Gallup, uh, a few years ago, made a, a huge survey of about two million uh, people and uh, about the level of engagement. And surprisingly enough, about 80% of the workforce is either passively or even worse, actively disengaged. So they basically sabotage what is the company trying to do. So if we a little bit over-exaggerate, the uh, world economy is chugging along for, uh, on a 20% of the capacity. Uh, lean, you know, uh, just in time, that basically have been exhausted and there's a uh, scale which is going down with uh, every dollar you invest in it. But if you in invest into engagement, uh, you don't have to pay overtime for people actually discovering the ideas, uh, giving you the solutions while they take in a shower or taking uh, their kids to school. You don't pay overtime for that, for going that extra mile. And, uh, you know, locally, when we were working with companies uh, just during the crisis, uh, it was very, very clear which company had actually connection between the leadership and, and, <clears throat> and the uh, employee because they have done the extra mile and they have delivered something which even made them stronger because they acquired their competition, which was ailing, or they, they have done uh, uh, things to at least uh, say, uh, salvage the situation. It is the responsibility of leaders uh, 
to create an environment that people strive, uh, that they could contribute, but also that they could uh, contribute to value creation. But at the same time, it is responsibility of the leaders to, uh, to allow them to participate, not only financially, but also in the social recognition of their work. Uh, this is something which has been uh, very, very um, uh, underestimated. We have done a quick survey for our client, uh, Big Bank, uh, which had a change of ownership. It was a big restructuring. And uh, we had 10 things, 10 items. Some of them are quite expensive, like a travel with, uh, to a luxurious resort with the family. And guess what? I mean, the number one desired uh, kind of prize was a dinner with the CEO. Somebody, uh, people wanted to, to get to know the leader they work for. So uh, it is a role uh, uh, for leaders to become true role models. Uh, when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, uh, studies, when we're young and growing up, uh, the most influential people, and that's not surprising, are our immediate uh, family members, father, mother, or uncle, or somebody in the uh, uh, immediate family. You know, fifth ranking celebrities, uh, and the good thing is that when we get wiser and older, these people are being replaced by community leaders, uh, by priests, uh, coaches, teachers, but mainly in the professional field by your immediate manager and superior. These people actually influence the way you manage your people in the future, how you look at management or rather leadership in the future. So I think there is no other way, or there's, people say there are different styles of leadership. I think there's only one, and that's leading by example. Uh, Peter mentioned diversity. I think this is uh, one... Uh, think which is very close to my heart and it's been a passion for at least uh, 10 years when we uh, with Hospodarsky and Ovine have founded uh, uh, top 25 inf influential women of the Czech business to show uh, the society there are competent and talented executives uh, and to provide the role models for young uh, women who would like to have not only family but also have a fulfilling professional life. Today, there was a small good news in Mlada Fronta, which reported that the inequality uh, of pay between women and men in, in Czech uh, decreased by 4% from 26% to 22 I think uh, we still have a way to go. Uh, we can talk about women in management uh, quite a lot, maybe during the Q&A, but I wanted to just say that this is not you know, a, a sex war issue. This is a pure fact Companies which have at least, you know, 30% of women in management, and that's a proven fact, uh, are 50% more financially successful. At the same time, the employees are much more uh, happy and satisfied with the work environment. I think this is, uh, there's not a causality, there's a very strong uh, correlation. But in my experience, in my belief, it is diversity of talent, diversity of different views, diversity which leads uh, to new solutions and to innovations, which Peter was mentioning. Uh, so uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to share any uh, questions or testimonials uh, even further during the Q&A. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. you have almost invited already the audience to ask the questions, but before we come to that, uh, I, I would like to do two things. First, to ask our panelists if they have any comments after the speeches uh, uh, to comment on each other, and then I will uh, uh, use my privilege as the moderator to ask one question. So is there anything at this moment you would like to comment in your speeches, or I can get, go ahead with my question? So uh, let's start with Peter. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think the questions that uh, Pavlina was, was uh, bringing up don't have very easy answers, frankly speaking, and, uh, but uh, they, are, they are extremely vital. I mean, we see that very often. Uh, people coming out of universities with the best, highest degrees, uh, and you start to integrate them in the daily work, and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't come out. 
there is this disconnect uh, between universities and real life, which uh, in some places is bigger, in some other places is less big, but in general terms it's still there. And when I said we were working with this women empowerment, for example, part of this is that uh, young graduates, we help them. For example, they have no idea how to write a CV. Yeah? So they, they, they are looking for a job, the first thing they don't even know how to write a CV. It's not part of your curriculum. It's not part of your curriculum to prepare yourself to ask the relevant questions. I mean, this is so simple, it is so basic, and yet in no way this is going to be a subject for a university. So I think there is a room uh, which is between the university and the real life where I think uh, we can help and we should help, we all should help. But I also think that the university should be a little bit more opener. Uh, especially in Europe, we have still an, an, uh, like an agony uh, against, uh, for example, business getting close to university. Uh, it is said uh, the university is going to lose its intellectual freedom. <laughs> this is absolutely uh, childish. Yeah? And, and instead of, of, of establishing these bridges, uh, we, we, we defend our own turf. So that's, that's an area I think absolutely necessary. Uh, the other question I thought was, um, we need systematic change. And you were asking, Paulina, uh, where will these changes come from? Uh, I don't think it will come neither from the educational system, because I think the educational system is so strongly embedded in their values, and I'm not saying they don't have values, I think they are very strong values, but they're also embedded in a political system which, rightly so, considers their education as one of the most important parts of their political activities. If you look into school books, for example, and uh, you see what children are being taught today, you would be surprised about the high political content that you find in those books. Because basically the educational system is being used, like you know from your past, uh, when it was used by, by the political party, but it is being used all over the world still today by political parties. So to get there a real change, I think is going to be a very, very difficult and long way. I think it can only come from the students themselves. They are the only one who really could start to fight and to, to open up these systems and to make it a much more, uh, let me call it, politically free and more objective system than what it is today. Thank you. I would just add one comment that um, when, you know, maybe a, make, make a parallel and build on, upon what Peter was just saying. Um, and maybe it's a challenging question for the businesses, but um, maybe what business can do is to look inside itself and maybe to open more uh, to the young talent. To make a parallel with the issue that you both mentioned with the women leadership and women equality, the recent study by McKinsey showed that we have been talking about that we need to strengthen the individual talent of women and that will bring them to the leadership of companies. Whereas the last study shows that uh, what needs to change and what uh, you know, women say that needs to change is the internal culture in companies. Because b with, without this change, uh, they will not get, uh, get to the leadership. Maybe the similar you know, um, point of view we can use when we are talking about the young talent and opportunities they are getting from the business. I would Thanks. only concur uh, with Peter's uh, uh, comments on uh, young people not being able to write a CV. Um, uh, we are on the other side of the food chain, but uh, occasionally somebody sends us CV and, and I have to uh, say that it is sometimes extremely terrible. There are even grammatical mistakes, uh, not even speaking about the structure of the information. Uh, but I think there are two things which could be done very quickly. Uh, 
while I was studying in the US, uh, it was uh, very normal that we have been, part of our curriculum was actually a uh, you know, session with a career advisor. Each university actually is providing professional help. You know, they have people on staff who actually prepare people to actually look at what they might be good at and how uh, the market actually values their education or not. You know, to maybe switch major and or at least take some courses which would equip them and make them more marketable. I think that's one thing which, which universities can v almost immediately uh, implement in their, uh, in their programs. And not having those professionals on their staff uh, actually look around the, com uh, the business community in the vicinity of the university. And, there are, and each CEO is basically chief human resource officer for his or her company. So they would be people who would be uh, uh, clearly available to help you put together at least basic curriculum for these kind of activities. The other source, of course, are the alumni which we also cannot, or, or uh, so far, the other universities only scratching the surface of using the resources of alumni, actually helping them create, for example, this career counseling or other programs like internships, which make, again, the, uh, the uh, graduates much more marketable in today's competitive world. The other, uh, we, were, we were talking about young people, and, and not because in five years I'll be 50, uh, but because it's a, it's a true demographic, demographic issue. And, you know, I was the f member of parliament 21, what the hell I knew about life, mm -hmm. you know, thanks God, I, I kind of had more luck than brains to evade it, uh, political career. But uh, since that, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, Czech um, comedian, Jan Verich said, an old fool, you know, uh, age is not a virtue because old fool was once a young fool. You know, so I think either way, any extreme, whether young or old, uh, you know, basically Western world is, is looking at a democratic, democratic crisis. And unless we can uh, integrate healthy, experienced and talented people above 50, again, uh, Peter pointed to the huge gap of talented people. Uh, we we not, we're not going to be competitive as Europe, you know. So, uh, women and 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 uh, elder people are two very low-hanging fruit, which we need to uh, kind of cultivate as a pool and appreciate as a pool of talent. And those companies which will do so will have a huge uh, uh, starting uh, heads up in in uh, kind of being able to lure uh, the talent of the future. Thank you, thank you very much. I have just asked about the time because I made a mistake. I left my watch <laughs> in the back there. So. Thank you. Could you remind me of a five minute notice before we are supposed to? So I will just use, uh, as I mentioned, the, the privilege to ask one question. This will be, it's different than which I have prepared because uh, one thing you just uh, Honza spoke about it, and you mentioned it is the gap between the demand, or the, the, what the, the businesses need, and what uh, the universities or the real life is offering. And I wonder, Peter, because you have been in the business for the longest time, you have the biggest experience. Is it worsening, and why? What are the reasons? Yeah, I think it is true that, uh, especially in Europe, I would say. For one reason or the other, and uh, it's not up to me to judge uh, why it happened. But if you look at the amount of people who are studying sociology and, and, and philosophy and, and, and are all s the societal sciences, this is where the biggest part of Europe's uh, use is spending their students' time. Uh, if you look at the, at, at the hard sciences, mathematics, physics, and chemics, this has come down substantially. And that's the area that we need in order to, 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 to maintain Europe as a competitive place. And I'm always jokingly asking, not so jokingly as a matter of fact, in which society would you have more confidence into the future? The one who produces 700,000 of lawyers the one who produces 700,000 of sociologists, or the one who produces 700,000 engineers every single year? Which one 
and to which society would you put your money? Well, it happens I would put my money into the engineers. Well, the reality is 700,000 lawyers is the USA, 700,000 sociologists is Europe, and 700,000 engineers is China and India. You see, this is a very fundamental question. And if you're talking to the industry, I was member up to last year to the, of the European Roundtable of Industrialists, where we had the 60 most important industrial groups. We made a commitment. We could engage immediately more than 50,000 engineers, immediately, just to fill the gaps that are existing today. That these industries have to go and to ask the governments to open up the borders in order to let people come in, which, by the way, was 10 years ago a great opportunity for Central European. Because one thing that was well done in the past, that the educational system of Central Europe and of Russia produced a very good amount of engineers, mathematicians, and things like this. That was a strong part of the educational system of the past, which we already didn't have on the other side. And we proved, I was on the advisory board of Sarkozy, I told him and we proved him, if he would allow 50,000 engineers coming from the Central Europe and Eastern Europe to come as immigrants to France, the French GDP would increase by 0.5% per year. Just 50,000 engineers. Uh, it, uh, it makes me nervous because uh, there are many more questions which uh, generates uh, whether we are doomed <laughs> because we don't have the state capitalism of China which uh, can make quota uh, to which school and uh, what, what number of uh, students. But uh, as I promised, uh, this, there should be a discussion. And so if I uh, may open the discussion and uh, invite some questions from the floor. Over, over here, please. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Well, uh, good afternoon, Jan Milfai, Microsoft Chairman for Europe. Uh, I really enjoy what all of you said about the people and the talent. In fact, I've got some keynote speech at Harvard over the weekend, and I spoke about future of Europe. And one issue <laughs> I addressed was the demand-supply discrepancy, because it's huge. In, in my industry, it's a one million open ICT jobs, and a lot of you know youth, as you said, 54% in Spain. But one suggestion I made. If we improve, you know, entrepreneurial education in Europe, that may, you know, help not only that people would create more startups, but you need to have entrepreneurial thinking in the companies, right? So I'm the member of the Junior Achievement Board here in Europe. I'm advisor of the Commission of Asilio, and I need to be self-critical, to be honest. I'm involved in the topic of education for the last seven years, and there's only incremental improvement in Europe. If you look at the OECD, PESA, a uh, very incremental improvement. There's Nordic countries, Germany a little bit better, and Poland, the rest is not doing very well. So give me each of you like three points how to improve entrepreneurial education here in Europe. <laughs> so uh, we will we, we, take we'll this listen. question. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I'll give you one for you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, no, uh, I just recently heard about um, a, a group of young, uh, that my friend visited Sweden, and uh, um, in, uh, during Saturday he entered a pub uh, that was, um, you know, a big uh, complex um, in a local municipality in Sweden, and he said, "I saw a groups of young people, you know, sitting over paper and working on something." And so he was curious to to uh, realize what they are doing, what they were doing. So during the, the dialogue, he, he found out that these young people were working on a project that, uh, for a tender that local company gave uh, or publicized uh, and invited young people um, and uh, uh, gave them opportunities. And the local municipality provided them with premises, uh, such, uh, you know, and mentorship in a local incubator. So I think that, you know, giving out opportunities for young people, not just teaching them entrepreneurship, but we need to show them why this is important, that it really leads to their better future. But I just have one, if this is okay. Anybody has three? 
Well, I have another one from one of the company where I'm on the board, uh, L'Oreal. L'Oreal has launched some years ago a worldwide competition, entrepreneurial competition, where teams from universities gather, and they are, don't have to be from the same university. They get a business case, and then the teams fight against each other until the last two teams, and they are invited to Paris and present the case to the management of L'Oreal, and finally one gets the thing. So this is a real trying to bring the real challenges, business challenges, at the level of universities. But this is extracurriculum. This is, this is just... So that's another way how to do it uh, on an extracurriculum base. And that? Uh, uh, we still owe uh, the communist uh, something that, that and, and the, I would say, early Wild East times of early 90s, that, that uh, businessman is still kind of something like a curse. You know, uh, we, we need new badas. Uh, we need people who have not stolen a thing, who have not, you know, uh, cheated on taxes, who have not uh, uh, robbed others in, in the voucher privatization to, to get rich. We, we need to promote and create role models of new bhatyas, uh, because that would actually create as a role model to people to actually go into business and start their own businesses to follow such a legacy. That's, one, that's for one, and that's for political leadership. Uh, for uh, communities, uh, there's a great example of what uh, Telefonica has been doing with social entrepreneurship, uh, you know, connecting with Paulina, that where, they, where they really uh, attract young people to do social entrepreneurship in their neighborhoods. They give them money, they give them uh, uh, mentorship, they help them with structure, and, and they also give them recognition. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, you want to repeat a success. Uh, and the last thing which I'm doing personally is something which you can, which each of us can do. Uh, I'm, I'm helping a friend who's teaching an entrepreneurship class, and every year I work with that class of students and being uh, kind of evaluating and helping them to actually, when they have a computer game against each other and a stock market, developing their companies. I think each of us can do the macro kind of uh, municipal thing uh, and, and also a personal experience, a personal contribution to the community. Thank you. I think in Czech Republic, uh, for the start, would be enough uh, to get rid of the new regulation or that all of the teachers have need some special uh, educational um, course or something like this. But we have a question here in the... Was it, was, yeah. Would you wait for the microphone, please? Thanks. I am from Toronto, Canada and have an academic background. One of the types of programs that works very well there are co-op programs where students, while they're at the university, spend part of their time in businesses and it helps to build practical aspects into the program because the students need to relate what they're learning in the classroom to what is happening in the business and it also allows the businesses an opportunity to assess those students before they enter a hiring stage. And it, it has been very successful, particularly in business schools, engineering schools, schools of that type. Yeah, may I ask, does it mean they leave, uh, let's say, after two years of the school and uh, for... No, they, this happens while they're at university. They would have one term at the university, and then one term they would have a job in a company, mm -hmm. and I then see. they come back to the university and carry on. Thank it's you. been very successful. But that's, that assumes a certain uh, cooperation between the university and the local businesses, which so far of has course. been quite a struggle. You know, but maybe even enticing businesses uh, and having, a, for example, a, a tax uh, you know, deductible amount to, to really make it attractive for them to invest and spend time with the young students would be a fantastic uh, you know, expenditure of taxpayers' money. Just run for it and I vote for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so next question, please. Oh, yes, uh, I completely agree with the CV. We recognized this uh, three years ago. So now we have not courses, but some education how to make presentation and CV. Unfortunately, we have plenty of curious uh, cases with respect to uh, improbability of our students, like Two weeks ago, I had uh, some director from middle-sized company talking about IT people. 
and he look, I am looking for talented people, and I suppose this is good for our applied informatics. And he said, no, I am looking to people who know some, something small about applied informatics, but I am looking people who are able to sell the softwares only. So you know, it's uh, also this uh, labor market is changing heavily. So we are discussing this, and I am completely agree that the practice during study program is the most important parameter for future. So thank you. We have like uh, five more minutes. So uh, there were some comments. If I can ask really for questions over there. Thank you. I am Eva Vondrákova, Association for Talent and Giftedness, and it is not question but information. Our Hungarian colleagues have initiated very nice uh, uh, program. It is toward uh, European Talent Support Network, and they uh, they are very able, and it is very very important. And they have conference in Budapest uh, in the May. So I would like to inform you about it, and if you are interested, I. I we will be pleased to say you more. Okay, thank you. Over there, in the back. Good afternoon, Linda Stutzbartova, Anglo-American University. Thank you for the talk on diversity and mentioning not only uh, females, but also Generation 50 plus. I have one challenging question. What about intercultural diversity? Because I think China is open, of course, United States are open, but Europe is becoming a fortress. And there is a danger that we will close, not only thanks to our very difficult asylum procedures, but thanks to very rigid uh, um, laws for refugees and so on. So how would you deal with that? Thank you for the question, which is quite a challenging question in these times. So with the nationalism rising, uh, election to European Parliament ahead of us, with probably with parties uh, stressing the need of uh, clean Central European or European society, so... I think it's not a, uh, it's not a challenge for uh, multinational corporations, as, as Peter mentioned. Uh, they are citizens of, of the globe and therefore already decades are, are circulating their expatriates around the world as they see fit for their needs and for their development. Uh, I see it clearly here when we uh, either repatriate Czechs or Slovaks back uh, or uh, bringing somebody who has a unique skill which just fits the company at the moment. Uh, it's much more uh, a question of, of really uh, EU policy on immigration and being able to open, especially for small businesses, which do not have the staff and capability to dealing with the immigration laws. So, anybody else? Please. No, 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 I, I, I fully agree. Um, but, um, you know, I think that the uh, global corporations, especially from the perspective of sustainability, they have to really think um, regardless of, uh, of the borders. Um, but, I, you know, what I'm aware of, or I'm afraid that, uh, of course, um, with com upcoming insecurity on the labor market, in Europe especially, certain trends or certain social tensions arise. And I think it's a national tr natural trend. I think the question is how are we going to uh, tackle them? And I, I think that one thing is to talking more about long-term strategy, talking more about what's going to happen in the next five, 10 years to and engage other stakeholders uh, for this discussion, to this discussion. But I think this discussion should be initiated by the political elites. I mean, it needs to be pushed by the businesses mm. because that's, that's their need. Mm. You know, since as Martin well, Jan have well. left for Volkswagen, there's nobody who's, talk, who's been able to talk locally uh, as, as, uh, for, of competitiveness of, of uh, the Czech business. But Peter comes from the Smith Switzerland. They have a fresh uh, experience with that, <laughs> no? Uh, I wouldn't dare to. Well, I think what... Uh, uh, there are two aspects to this. The first one is that, frankly speaking, by creating the European common market and assuring the freedom of movement of capital, goods, and people, which are the three fundamentals, 
I think enormous progress has been achieved. Now, there was a price to that. We didn't talk too much about the price. The price was by giving freedom to 28 nationalities to move freely within Europe, we have closed and we have created a certain wall against the rest of the world. And that's, I think, the question you were answering. That's why you're mentioning China and perhaps India, because, yes, it is true. On the one hand, we brought down the walls. On the other hand, we built some more, which was stronger. So that's one aspect. But I think overall it is still very, very positive. Just think about 28 nationalities have freedom to move, to go, to study, to work, etc. So I think it was, it's, it's a very important uh, step forward. Now, what happens uh, now and what will happen and what I think is coming is that uh, I don't think Switzerland uh, uh, was an, uh, is an exception in the expression of what the people really feel. As a matter of fact, uh, I would say that if uh, many European countries would have this democratic freedom that Switzerland has, uh, that it can vote on any subject directly, uh, I think the outcome would be in big part of, of Europe at least the same, most probably even stronger than, as a reaction towards uh, this uh, perhaps uh, uh, unrestricted freedom of, 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 of personal movements. And I think part of the political environment is clearly taking advantage of, uh, of this tension, social tension that this has been created. And I think we are going to see in the next European elections uh, a clear uh, shift towards uh, the part which is against this freedom of, of, of uh, movement of the population, even within our, our Europe. And I think we should be very careful not to lose this privilege that I think Europe has negotiated for itself over the last couple of years. The one who will be suffer on that, the first and the most, are the young people. In Switzerland, the first reaction and the first one who have been immediately touched was Erasmus and the research people. So suddenly the, the Swiss who, for the, who could go out and who could do one semester in Spain or one semester in Germany, it's closed down immediately. So the first one who are suffering of this xenophy is always the young people. So I think we should be very careful and really defend as much as we can the principle of freedom of movement of the three things, capital, goods, and people. You cannot cut off just one part of it and say, yeah, we want to have freedom of capital and goods, but we don't want to have freedom of, of people. It doesn't work. So that's a very important part, and I think a political part and the discussion that Europe has to have. I think we have time, or not, <laughs> uh, for a last question, or you need one comment? No, no we have to... Uh, I see. I see. So uh, thank you very much for this moment, and uh, it was like concluding remark that uh, something... Uh, uh, if the first ones who were touched by this uh, uh, new law were young people, probably those will be the first one who will change it. And uh, which is, uh, I think, a great hope, only, not only for the case of this particular case, uh, law, but uh, for whole Europe. And uh, as Pavina mentioned, there should be uh, some political courage. I think we can't expect it from the gen this generation. It's my generation of politicians, around 50s, but. I still believe somewhere behind them are already waiting those ones who will uh, turn it around in the better direction. So thank you very much, and please join me in uh, applause for our panel, because, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. On behalf of organizing committee, especially Sonia Baca, I am very thankful for panelists, especially to Peter Brabeck, and also for Daniel, for, uh, I have to read it, for Pavlina and Premisov. Honza, yeah. Honza, thank you very much for uh, this beautiful discussion. And I think I have more questions as answer after this discussion. Probably you have the same feeling like me. Thank you very much, and see you 2016. Maybe Sonia? Okay.
Is there, is there a... Thank you. The, the speech started with us being told, people should make a difference. Wasn't it the title? <laughs> Success to business. People are the success to business. Gen ladies and gentlemen, that's you, right? And I think these are the last words you want to say. It's up to you the type of world you want to live in. So let's make it a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.